Good morning, good evening, and good afternoon, uh, wherever you are. Again, welcome again, uh, our live show uh, in the International Emergency Medicine Education Project. And this session, we are hosting Asian medical students, and we will learn their experience about uh, emergency medicine in their setting. And before we start, uh, I would like to actually share some information about this project to you. And the uh, International Emergency Medicine Project is a, uh, a kind of social responsibility initiative, we can say, supported by the United Arab Emirates University uh, College of Medicine and Health Science and uh, endorsed by the International Federation for Emergency Medicine, which is the global umbrella of the emergency medicine around the world. And uh, as you know, we provide free resources for medical students and we are trying to promote emergency medicine in medical students. Uh, for medical students. So we have a couple of resources uh, that medical students and educators can uh, get benefit from. One of them is iam-student.org platform, which is our main hub uh, for all our resources, like, you know, book chapters or downloadable books, uh, uh, the picture, our uh, clinical image archives, videos, and uh, the MCQs and something like this. And we have also iam-course.org platform, which we provide free uh, the courses for medical students who are in need uh, in case uh, their education is somehow affected by the pandemic. And uh, today uh, we are live in uh, Twitter, YouTube and Facebook in the same time. And of course, uh, the audience can watch uh, this uh, the live session in the iem-student.org slash TV page. And uh, uh, one of the new addition to our uh, the resources is that uh, 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 is a, a, the new uh, the courses uh, actually developed by the the emergency procedures, uh, which is we are recently uh, communicated with. But uh, before then, this uh, you can find this resource in our uh, the web page. And also we are publishing uh, new procedures for medical students uh, the, every Monday. Uh, I think it will go uh, the next uh, 10, 12 weeks or so. Uh, but you can reach these resources with this uh, website. And uh, we definitely want to thank uh, doctors, you know, for John Myers and uh, the James Myers and John McKenzie uh, from Australia. Uh, yeah. And of course, uh, we do some live sessions and today we are going to host uh, Asian students uh, and we will learn their emergency medicine perspectives. And uh, maybe you already saw the flyer. We have three uh, guests, uh, Nandita from India, uh, Sila from Turkey and Nanet from Philippines. And we are so excited to host them actually in this session. And uh, before further ado, actually, you know, uh, I like to invite the our uh, the chair in the IFM, uh, the Dr. James Kwan. Uh, he is the core curriculum and uh, education committee chair. Hi, James. Hello, Alpha. Great to be back again. Thanks for inviting me to coffee. So, hello, everyone. My name is James Kwan. Um, as Alpha introduced me, I'm chair of the IFM core curriculum and education committee and privileged to be actually working in Singapore as an emergency physician at the moment. Um, I'd like to, to extend a warm welcome to everyone around the world joining us for another Coffee Chat event. We've had about five of these now. I think we've had exactly five of this. This is the fifth one. And they've turned out to be very engaging, very um, you know, enjoyable to meet students uh, across the world to hear you know, the, about their experiences. I'd like to thank Alpa again for inviting me to coffee and the opportunity to have an informal chat um, over coffee with our student leaders. At this time, our student leaders from Asia, Nandita from India, Nanette from Philippines, and Scylla from Turkey. As a specialty, I'd just like to say a few words about emergency medicine. Emergency medicine really provides many diverse and unique learning opportunities for medical students. And I'm really looking forward to hearing from our student leaders, their experience as students in emergency medicine and how an international community such as us in, at IFM could better support them as students. So um, 
before we uh, go on with further introductions, um, I'd like to use this opportunity to um, to welcome those who joined us on uh, different social media platforms. Just a few words on housekeeping, if that's so, um, uh, as we've done in the past. This event is actually being live streamed on a range of social media platforms, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and actually on the IEM website. Um, you won't be able to speak during the event. Please share your questions, comments, reflections on the social media platform you're using to view this event. We will be able to see your comments from all the social media platforms, and we will attempt to answer as many questions as we can, although the with time limitations, we probably you know, will only get a few questions answered. Needless to say, please uh, share your comments in a professional manner. Now sit back uh, with your coffee, tea, or your favorite beverage and enjoy the event. <laughs> Thank you, Alpha. <laughs> Thank you, James. And also, I think we need to mention the, the Dr. Elif Chakal sport uh, behind the scene. Uh, the, she is the, the main organizing person, actually, of this activity. Uh, the all communications done by uh, Dr. Elif Chakal, and uh, she finds our guests and invites them and uh, and prepare the, our outline, what we are discussing in the in the in the, the session. So thank you, Elif. Uh, unfortunately, she is not here live today. Uh, but we have another guest uh, live with us, which is our president elect in IFM, uh, Dr. Fionn Davis. Thank you, Dr. Javik. Hello, everybody all over the world. And welcome to your coffee chat. My name is Fionn Davis, and I'm an emergency physician in the UK. Uh, as Dr. Javik said, I am the next president of the International Federation for Emergency Medicine. And as explained, it's the IFEM that supports this project wholeheartedly because we know the value of attracting medical students into emergency medicine. I fell in love with emergency medicine 30 years ago when I was a student, and here I am now. So I really hope you enjoy this session. It's really interesting for you to find out what your colleagues all over the world have as an experience of emergency medicine in medical school because it is very, very varied across the world. So I wish you all a great uh, session and thank you to the organizers for putting on these sessions time and time again and, and having a great success with them. Nice to meet you all. You thank, you, thank you, Fionn. thank you, Fionn. Fionn, before, before you leave us, uh, could you please uh, say something about the upcoming IFEM events, uh, live events? Sure. Yes, yeah, so we have a, a program of events that we've been running online and uh, they are of different scales. So we've done some big scale ones. We're going to start doing some smaller scale ones lasting just maybe one hour instead of three hours. And medical students get a discount price of five US dollars for all of the events that we lay on. So uh, look, look at the IFEM um, Twitter account or social media accounts in order to find out what's going on. Um, we've just run a, a series and we're just on a little lull, but hopefully as soon as the conference is over, we have an annual international conference that will be in June in Australia. As soon as the conference is finished, then we'll have another schedule of events for you to all join. Great, great. Thank you very much uh, for all your support to this project and thank you being with us again. Bye everyone. Okay, James, uh, I think we have one more guest joining us with video, actually, uh, the message. Uh, it, it is Axel Siu. Maybe you know him already, uh, the president of Asian Society. So let me uh, share the Axel's messages with the audience. Hi, everyone. I'm Dr. Axel Siu, the president of the Asian Society for Emergency Medicine. Today, it is my greatest honor to be here to welcome you for this live session on emergency medicine perspectives of Asian medical students. Emergency medicine is a young specialty in the world of medicine. It is rapidly evolving in most of the developed countries in the world. However, in Asia, especially in some parts of Asia, emergency medicine is not well developed and even not being recognized. So, it is very important for us, for all our Asian emergency medicine colleagues to work together to facilitate the development of emergency medicine in Asia. Not only 
for our emergency medicine resident trainee, but also for our next generations, our undergraduate medical students. Asian Society for Emergency Medicine was established in 1998 and is the biggest international collaboration for emergency medicine in Asia. We endeavor to make our specialty stronger. Sustainability is one of the most essential elements in keeping our pace for a stronger specialty. Therefore, we cherish every seed that we can plant and hope in future they will grow and have our specialty to be bigger and stronger in future. Today, we have the privilege to have a live session of the sharing with the Asian medical students organized by the International Emergency Medicine Education Project. We hope more people, not restricted to medical students, but also for our emergency medicine resident trainee and also educator. We learn about the life of our medical students in emergency medicine in Asia for this experience sharing today. I'm sure all the audience will be benefit a lot by these live sessions. Finally, I would like to take this opportunity to congratulate the organizer, the International Emergency Medicine Education Project for successfully organizing these live sessions. And I wish every success for the project in future. Thank you very much. Yeah, we thank Axel too. Uh, hopefully we will see each other again uh, in person uh, in the next conference, hopefully. Uh, James, I think it's time to invite uh, our guests one by one, right? Uh, I think they can shortly introduce themselves and then we can start chat. So yes, I'm inviting you. Nandita from India. Hi, Nandi. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Nandita Vinod, a third year medical student pursuing my medical degree from Christian Medical College, which is situated in Bangalore, in the southern part of the incredibly diverse country of India. And I'm extremely excited to be a part of this conference and look forward to sharing my experiences regarding emergency medicine education in my country, India, and more importantly, learning from the experiences of the other speakers. And I'm positive that this brainstorming session would definitely yield some innovative solutions to the common challenges that all of us face as Asian medical students who are interested in emergency medicine. Thank you for having me here. <laughs> Thank you, Nandita, for accepting our invitation. Now I'm inviting uh, Sila from Turkey. Hi everyone, uh, this is Sula and I'm an intern at Marmara University School of Medicine, which is located in Istanbul, Turkey. And as a quick introduction of myself, I'm an aspiring intern who's very interested in emergency medicine department and in general surgery department. But emergency medicine department holds a special place at my heart. And before we go on, I would like to welcome everyone to this very meeting and thank you all for participating. Thank you, Sula, for accepting our invitation too. And now I'm inviting our last guest, uh, Nanette from... Hello, uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everyone watching. I am Nanette Daroha, a medical student from University of the Philippines College of Medicine. I'm currently a clinical clerk or a fourth year student in Philippine General Hospital. I feel very honored to be here today to talk to you about the undergraduate emergency medicine education in our country and my experiences so far. I'm also very excited to hear from my fellow medical students from Turkey and India, Sila and Nandita. So thank you so much for having me here. Of us in the screen and start chatting. Yes, James, this microphone is yours now. <laughs> well, the mic is mine, is it? Yes, it is. <laughs> We, we, we're trying to make this as informal as we can. And I think, you know, with a live audience, this is really about having a coffee chat and, you know, tapping into the experiences of our students. So we wanted to hear a lot more from them this time around. Um, so I, I guess this is a question, you know, because it's a virtual session, probably start off with Nandita. And um, let's start off with a really sort of common question, because I, I actually don't know a lot about 
being a student or even ex the experiences of emergency medicine uh, in India. So perhaps, Nandita, you can just shed some light on what's your experience of um, emergency medicine uh, where you are at the moment in India. So uh, emergency medicine is a niche and upcoming specialty in my country, India. And uh, my college being a super specialty tertiary care and research center, it definitely does have a bustling and well-organized emergency department, which is actually a 50-bedded independent clinical unit. And it handles almost uh, 240 to 300 emergencies each day. And I would say that it forms the very core of the functioning of our hospital as such. So, uh, speaking about our education experience in the emergency medicine department, uh, I remember a quote from uh, William Osler at this point, which, uh, which goes like this, that trying to study medicine uh, without books is like sailing an uncharted sea, but studying medicine without patients is like not going to sea at all. So, during the COVID pandemic, we had a huge challenge of, uh, with most of the clinical subjects like medicine, surgery, because we did not have any offline classes in patient interaction as such. But we were lucky to get a brief two-week posting in the ED between the second and third COVID waves where we actually got to meet patients and learn from them. So uh, speaking about the posting, uh, what is great about our posting is that it was not merely in the form of didactic lectures or uh, a theoretical basis of learning emergency medicine. Instead, the focus was more on simulations and practical based learning. So we were given uh, scenarios, like the professors would give us a scenario like a pulses electrical activity or a ventricular tachycardia. And we performed the simulation uh, in groups where we are each assigned a role and we simulate the uh, functions that each person in the team perform. And we say the steps of the BLS or the ACLS out and out and we evaluated on the basis of that. In addition, we also have a simulation lab in uh, emergency medicine department um, where we have uh, mannequins known as the sim man. So this is particularly interesting because um, we are given simulations and scenarios such as uh, snake bites or poisoning, uh, even in coordination with other subjects like forensic medicine. And the mannequin actually is able to show the clinical signs and uh, symptoms of each of these signs of poisoning. And we then work as teams and we are actually able to inject uh, drugs and do interventions and we are able to see the vitals change um, as we do each of these interventions. So uh, we are able to be exposed to how it is that an emergency medicine specialist thinks on their feet, makes life-saving decisions in the span of a second. And we are exposed to the uh, high uh, adrenaline rush that we would generally get when we are a part of such a specialty. And in addition to this, we also have a one-week posting during our internship where we are able to perform some basic procedures on uh, real-life patients too. In addition, our college is also unique because we have a two-year posting in peripheral areas, in rural areas, following our uh, medical degree. And um, most of our students have to work in extremely remote areas where the uh, hospitals, they tend to, uh, there won't be much uh, medical uh, facilities available in those areas. And in fact, some of the hospitals are run by only one or two doctors. So the uh, knowledge that we gain from our undergraduate experience in emergency medicine does prove useful to all of us, regardless of whether we take emergency medicine as a specialty in the future or not. And in addition to this, our emergency medicine department does a great job of facilitating student research. So all in all, our experience in the emergency department was indeed great. And um, I would say that it, our emergency medicine department has really done a good job in teaching students. This is great. Wow. Great to hear. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> That's a wonderful overview of, uh, you know, your experiences in emergency medicine. And, uh, I, and I guess uh, how lucky you are uh, that two weeks, you know, live posting uh, or live rotation in emergency medicine, especially during the pandemic, um, a big challenge for all of us. And I probably will need to chat a little bit about that because I think our experiences, you know, across uh, different countries will differ. Um, Scylla, share with us what's your experience like in Turkey? Well, uh, we, uh, my emergency medicine clerkship was almost about like three months ago and it was a hands-on experience for two months long period of time. And it was fantastic, like to begin with. And at that two months period of time, you work in, ten, in groups, which is formed by 10 people 
it can be your friends, it can be anyone. And at that teamwork, you learn how to cooperate with your colleagues while you're handling critical situations. And when we look at the structure of our education system, we see that there are three main zones at our emergency medicine department. And uh, there is the red zone where the most critical patients are handled. And then there is the yellow zone and then there is the green zone. So the in us, the interns, with like we work, we have the chance to work with our superiors, and with the superiors, I mean the EM specialists and the residents in EM department. And with their guidance, we are able to participate, actually participate, actually in the critical thinking process of handling critically ill patients. And at the same time, we are able to uh, actively participate in the invasive procedures, which I enjoyed a lot during the clerkship. And with all being said, uh, with all of these parts of education at our EM department, towards the end of our clerkship, we get more comfortable with handling critically ill patients with a more, more calm manner. And with that confidence, we also uh, feel more like a real doctor at the end of the EM clerkship. And like people like me get more interested in EM clerkship, uh, want to pursue their career in that direction. So that's all about it in my part. So what about you, Nanette? How's, how's your experience in terms of the EM clerkship? It sounds, it sounds amazing, Stella. So for in the Philippines, emergency medicine for undergraduate students is actually highly dependent on the partner hospital at the university because um, not all hospitals in the Philippines have uh, emergency medicine as a separate department. And in most universities, students only get exposure when they are rotating in other departments. So for example, you only get experience pediatric emergency medicine when you're rotating in pediatrics. So however, in our institution, which is a tertiary teaching hospital, um, pre-pandemic, uh, medical students are allowed to rotate in the emergency department for around two weeks. So during the clerkship year, uh, our fourth year students are allowed to perform procedures and assist in the department, while the interns or the fifth year students are actually expected to handle patients already while supervised by the residents. Um, students are also taught basic life support, triaging, ECG reading, primary survey approach, etc. However, uh, during the pandemic and now with the implementation of the new universal health care law in the Philippines, there's been several changes in the clerkship curriculum. So it's now patterned after the basic emergency care course developed by WHO and ICRC. And since students are not allowed, currently not allowed to rotate in the emergency department, our training has been limited to modules. Uh, this includes lectures, small group discussions, and simulations. But uh, the topics are still the same. It still includes BLS, ACLS, uh, primary secondary survey approach, triaging toxicology, approach to trauma, and more. So actually their goal is to equip um, medicine graduates with knowledge and skill, and more importantly, the approach that's unique to emergency medicine, so that when we uh, encounter emergencies wherever we are, whether as general practitioners or specialists, we're actually ready to handle such cases. Thank you, thank you. All three actually are the ama amazing experiences you guys are getting. Of course, the, the COVID-19 unfortunately affected many, uh, many, many programs. Uh, I believe that yeah, not just... Uh, what? Let's talk about COVID-19 because... <laughs> okay. What, yeah, I mean, we're going to talk about this because uh, as you can see, the, um, you know, Nanette's having a very different experience here to yeah. both Scylla and Nandita. So we always think about COVID-19 as a negative, you know, thing in our lives. And certainly it stopped a lot of what we can do. I'd like to really ask something of Nanette. What worked well in, you know, during this period where you couldn't rotate to the emergency department? What were the elements of your program in emergency medicine that worked well for you? I think there's been an improvement in like uh, strengthening our theoreticals, though we may have some uh, problems with learning 
the skills that we need. Um, I think this time that we are um, learning online, we, we have more time to to strengthen our theoreticals. But I guess you miss that part of, with the patient. So you're missing, uh, you potentially have missed out that interaction with the patient, which is in no small part an important area. Um, Silla, what are your thoughts in terms of, um, you know, having just a virtual experience versus a live experience? What, what worked well for you with the live experience that you had in the emergency department? Well, having hands-on experience in emergency department is really valuable. I can say that because like, uh, I don't know why it is that important for me, but I can tell you that like seeing that patient coming through that door and observing their, uh, rea their reactions to their disease, their symptoms and everything and understanding, trying to understand what's wrong with them starting from the moment that they enter through those doors is really valuable and besides that having hands-on experience enables you to handle patients by yourself because in turkey i think the Mo the most different thing from other countries is that they let us to be in get involved in many steps of the patient care which includes uh, being part of the critical thinking in handling the patients and at the same time getting involved in the invasive procedures which start with the patient's intubation and ends with the uh, nasogastric tube and the every single thing in between and you get to perform every single invasive procedure you get to do every single approach to very different kinds of uh patient conditions and you get more confident about it with time towards the end of your clerkship because uh the most important thing for example for the invasive procedures is that we know that every single person has different anatomical variations and this anatomical variations can only be seen by getting experience about doing those invasive procedures and like according to my experience i did approximately more than like 20 of each of the invasive procedures and at towards the end of it i was feeling more confident and i was feeling like i can do it do this thing at the field by myself without any hesitation and this kind of experience lets you uh, lets the student to be more comfortable to handle critical situations at the field when they're alone. And at the same time, uh, having hands-on experience can also give you the taste of how to be like an EM specialist, actually. And it can lure you towards the EM residency, just like it did to me. And I don't know, it's such a fascinating thing, all that adrenaline, all that like CPR and everything. You see that the patient is recovering from their disease with the maneuvers that you do to that patient. It's fascinating. So I don't know, like for me, it's not like if you're doing an online version of EM's res like clerkship, you should also do a part at hands-on EM clerkship because it's such a different feeling. Thank you, Silla. I think that's I think that's great insight into you know um, both Nanette and yourself have actually you know uh, shared with us. What are, what the, there are positive elements of both a virtual experience and a live experience. I think you know as we always say in medical education, it's always a hybrid you know approach that seems to be working well. You know the best of every you know of everything. Um, yes, there are bits missing. What about you, Nandita? How, how was your experience? You you had a bit of a shorter uh, rotation, didn't you? You had a, a two week rotation, if I remember correctly. Um, how was that two weeks for you in the middle of the pandemic? Um, well, I can attest to this that uh, personally speaking, I always had this kind of a nightmare that before this two week posting in emergency medicine, that if uh, suppose I'm caught in a scenario like I'm in an aeroplane and suddenly someone needs CPR to be performed and they ask <laughs> who's a Right. So we were totally inequipped on how to do these uh, basic life support algorithms before this two-week posting. And um, I'm sure everyone would agree that 
actually reading about CPR, the depth of the compressions and everything, and actually performing it is a totally different ball game. So I don't know how much theory can be applicable as far as emergency medicine is concerned, because I feel it's more uh, practical oriented specialty. In addition, there is also a unique uh, uh, thing about the Indian scenario that emergency department is often, uh, unfortunately, it's often the uh, site of many workplace related violence because very often this is due to a miscommunication between the doctors and the patients and the patient's relatives. So uh, the idea of how to communicate bad news or to communicate a bad prognosis or the emotional aspect of how to deal with these things and how to uh, speak to patients, the communication aspects, uh, all these things tend to be lost out during the virtual uh, sessions. Like we don't get the hang of how to deal with patients in real life. So I feel this two-week posting was incredibly valuable in teaching us all these aspects and also helps us to actually perform all these things uh, live and uh, perfect our technique of how to do these procedures. So I would completely agree with uh, Silla when she says that definitely in addition to a virtual uh, program, we definitely also need a, a hands-on experience in emergency medicine to perfect our skills. Yeah, yeah this is that, great. That's great. Amazing. I, I'm sharing with us, uh, you know, your experience. Alpa, your thoughts? Yeah, actually, uh, honestly, definitely, the, the, the COVID-19 really affected uh, uh, yeah, the, the standard training that we used to, uh, you know, uh, the follow through. But uh, I think there are some positive uh, effects also, such as using the, uh, this type of technologies definitely increased. And it's now, I think it's, a, it's ordinary for us uh, every day. Uh, they're having a meeting virtually somewhere else around the world and uh, the meeting with, you know, there's some experts or friends. I think uh, the technology a little bit uh, pushed positively, I guess, in medical education. Uh, I can say that. Uh, but uh, again, uh, I agree that there's some countries, some institutions, uh, in order to protect the, their students, which is uh, my institutions also did actually, we uh, protect our students to, to reach the really risky areas. Actually, uh, we didn't want them, especially in the early phase, uh, we didn't want our students to expose uh, the things that we don't know really what's going on. So it's, it was actually very difficult. But uh, for my uh, institution, uh, we were somehow lucky uh, because we finished the, all our student groups in the emergency medicine that year. And then uh, the WHO announced that this is a pandemic. And, but we, we, fin we finished already our groups. <laughs> so uh, we didn't do much after all. So we didn't have a new senior group of students to go into in that hot period. But the fifth year medical students, for example, they are prohibited to go. Uh, but in the next academic year, uh, what we did, we, we changed our uh, the shift, uh, for example, number. It was 11 shift they were doing in four weeks. We decreased to seven, for example, and they were doing nine to 10 hours shifts with us. So we decreased those hours, exposure hours to six hours, and we put a kind of one hour gap between each shift change. So the groups didn't overlap each other uh, in case of some kind of uh, positive exposure and a risk. But there are multiple you know, activities actually that happened, uh, and we use extensively uh, the virtual platforms to teach our students. And we used uh, simulation and skills lab uh, more than the you know, other years uh, because we need to fill the gaps anyway uh, because less patient exposure affects their decision making definitely. So yeah, how, how about your side? I mean, uh, what did you yeah. guys do in, in Singapore? Uh, to, to, to be honest, I think our consensus and locally where I work, which is a hospital called Tan Tok Seng Hospital, um, it's actually um, adjacent to the National Center for Infectious Diseases, so NCID, which took a lot of the, um, the COVID cases right at the beginning of the pandemic. Um, what's interesting is, is that, you know, our, uh, our students needed to be protected, I guess, not being exposed to unnecessarily to the risks of, you know, being infected with the COVID virus. But the other thing is is that how do we protect them better is to actually educate them so we were very very um 
I use the word aggressive, but I think it's probably another word that I can't think of at the moment uh, in trying to bring them back into the clinical setting. So we train them well to put on PPE. We limited, yep. I guess, the scope of risk for our students um, in the actual emergency department and start in specific areas where we knew that they were COVID positive or the risk was very high. Um, but we did bring them back very earlier on. And we also decided that, you know, within the scope of the, um, we had this uh, washout rule where students couldn't uh, go to another posting or another rotation without having had a washout period. So we condensed our emergency uh, medicine postings to two weeks, um, but trying to keep the number of shifts almost the same as the pre-pandemic level. And I think um, we succeeded. I think the our, all our emergency departments uh, work closely with the universities to ensure that our students could get the best experience possible. So yes, we took a different stance. We did want to bring them back early. And now our students are very well trained in putting on uh, PPE in, you know, uh, in basic um, infection control procedures. And, um, and I'm, I'm really happy that this, uh, this is where we are today. So kudos to our students, actually, for taking on, you know, for working with us and our universities and our hospitals for working with us on this. Yeah. Uh, I just want to ask the, uh, uh, I know the Nandita said that two weeks rotation uh, they're having in their institution and Kezban said that it's uh, it's two months, if I remember correctly. The Nanet, it, 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 for you, is it four week? Uh, was it was it four week for you, Nanet? For us, it's only two weeks for the two whole weeks. year, for a yeah. Yeah. So how different they actually this uh, the range, right? Uh, the recently actually we communicated multiple experts around the world for the one of the IFM projects. And yeah, as you said, uh, from st starting from the, you know, two weeks to nine weeks, you know, range in the world. It's it's so, so interesting, actually. Uh, so as, as a student, what do you think the best period uh, for you? What, what do you think it can be enough in your training? Well, uh, shall I go on with the questions answer? Sure. Uh, go for yeah. it. What I think about it is that like two months was for a person who is really interested in emergency medicine, two months were like even short for me because I was <laughs> spending more time there. I was spending even my off times there trying to learn more about the ultrasound techniques and other techniques and other invasive procedures. But if I look in the general picture, I can say that like we can take two months out, two weeks out of the two months period and actually put it one year beforehand. And at that two weeks period, we can give a short course to the students who are going to be at the EM department about how they are going to handle the critical situation. Like Nandita said, how they are going to handle the bad news, how they're going to like do the CPR and everything. Okay, it is really different in the field, but before knowing some stuff beforehand gets you more prepared and gets you get your guards up for the upcoming things and makes you feel more comfortable with the upcoming situations. And because like for me, the first two weeks of two months period was really uh, stressful because I was trying to learn what what I'm going to prescribe to the patient who comes with a stomach ache, what I'm going to do with the patient who comes with suspicious appendicitis and everything. So like giving a short course, who, which will inform the patients, the students about how they can correlate their preclinical and clinical knowledge to EM rotation can make them more comfortable at the field and at the same time give them the opportunity to explore different um, conditions in a much more depth. So uh, for me, like those two months were even short, <laughs> but like when I look for the every single person at my um, clinical rotation, I can say that like two weeks can be subtracted from the two months periods and given to the fifth year and to prepare the students for the upcoming EM rotation and then put them into the field. 
and see the, what will they do at the field with all of that knowledge. So this will be my suggestion for our <laughs> <laughs> thank you the two months period thing. Yeah, yeah. Actually, there are some institutions uh, apply what you say. They have multiple exposures for students in different years. Of course, the you know terms or periods are different. Uh, but definitely, I, I agree with you what you're recommending uh, from your experience. I think it's very logical. Uh, more the exposure, they they learn more, of course, and uh, and pre pre preparing them for the future, you know, the you know the more senior you know rotation uh, in their uh, the, the training. I think it is definitely work very well. Uh, how about you, Nandita? Uh, what do you? you know, suggest, I mean, two weeks is enough or would you prefer one year? <laughs> Actually, we were so sad to leave the emergency department behind at the end of two weeks. So we were really requesting our uh, professors to uh, prolong the posting maybe by another two weeks. But it's actually hard to put in those many number of days for one particular uh, specialization. But I think that, uh, like Sila said, um, definitely it's a good idea to integrate emergency medicine with other subjects. Because I know I said that we had a two-week posting in emergency medicine, but that was core emergency medicine. We spent the entire day in ED. Uh, in addition to this, we also had exposures in our uh, second year, for instance, where uh, in addition to forensic medicine, we had an ex uh, a one or two-day 